You're uh, all very welcome to this uh, first Wednesday event, uh, which is actually a postponed first part of uh, our uh, autumn series on ecological sustainability. Uh, and today we will be in conversation with Owen Dalton, who is, um, and we'll be talking about ideas in his book on rewilding. And we are very excited about uh, listening about it and talking more about um, uh, these ideas, especially in these difficult times that, that we are facing at the moment and we can take our minds of, uh, you know, very difficult world problems and, and situation, especially in Palestine. So um, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Concert Worldwide, who is our longstanding partner and make the um, the first Wednesday possible by financial support and also uh, Department of International Development in Minute University, who is our longstanding uh, partner and provide us with amazing moderators for, for first Wednesdays. And Eilish, Dr. Eilish Dillon uh, will be from, from uh, this department, will be moderating today. Uh, the conversation with uh, Owen Dalton. So also just wanted to tell you the way it works. You are all muted on entry and uh, because we don't want to disturb the conversation of our uh, moderator and speaker. And uh, if you have any questions, please use uh, chat and email, sorry, text uh, uh, Fiocra, who is uh, who you see as Colaf Q&A Fiocra, and your questions will be asked at the end uh, of uh, this conversation. Uh, so Eilish will ask this question to, to Owen. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I pass, it, my, pass the voice to Eilish and Owen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Aga. Um, as Aga said, I'm Eilie Stiller from the Department of International Development uh, at Maynooth University, and we're delighted to be working again with Colof this year in the first Wednesday series. For many years now, people have been gathering to explore and debate and learn about and organize and imagine otherwise in the face of the big challenges of our time. Uh, we were just talking about it earlier. These first Wednesday series has been going on, this particular one for about 20 years or so. And prior to that, it was a rejuvenation of a series from back in the 1980s. So all during those times, kind of intersecting uh, issues of global justice, rights, equality and sustainability, sustainability have been at the heart of what the first Wednesdays have been all about. And no less so, of course, this season, which has been looking at ecological sustainability and finding the way ways in. Um, how can projects that we've been focusing on the last time many of you may have been at uh, this session that looked at the work of Shield to Cree and the B project in Oliver Bond Street. And how can those kinds of projects take us beyond narrow conceptions of environmentalism and green solutionism? And what do these projects pay attention to, maybe in a different way to others and why? And of course, as uh, Aga mentioned, as we're aware of, you know, the utter disregard for human life in Palestine and in other conflicts and wars around the world, so too we're also very conscious and more so these days of our exploitative consumerist neoliberal economic system and its impact on the most vulnerable and the urgency of immediate action and yet the inadequacy of responses. And one of the things that Koloff has been very conscious of and very focused on is that while we know the facts, a lot of facts, not all facts, of course, about these issues, we also are increasingly aware that knowledge itself is not enough. Um, it's about finding other ways and living differently and making the kinds of choices and changing systems which set in motion alternative ways of seeing and relating to the world and to each other in a more holistic and life generating kind of mutually supportive ways. So this series is trying to not stay on the surface of issues around sustainability, building on Kolov's work with the Dara project. We're talking not necessarily about promises and technical solutions, but trying to consider and reflect more deeply about all of our role in relation to the land and exploitation, both historically and today, but
but also how we can hold all this together while trying to do things differently and in a more life giving way. And that's really why this evening is really particularly special, because we I'd like to welcome, as Aga has done, Owen Dalton, the author of the much acclaimed book. And I I was one of the first people I well, I don't know if I was one of the first, but I definitely pre ordered it. An Irish Atlantic Rainforest, a personal journey into the magic of rewilding. And uh, Owen has been doing things differently, or maybe, I don't know, you can say in a few minutes if you think it is, Owen, uh, moving to Beira in West Cork uh, and to 73 acres of land. And I suppose looking and trying to understand in from what I've read and I understand of his work, understand the land differently and seeing it in a rich, diverse bio history, kind of a looking at it historically as a, a living remnant of millennia of past living things, um, but also destruction and potential going hand in hand. So as many of you know, um, many of you have read this book, I'm sure uh, it's an incredibly beautiful, a really exciting, a very rich, but also a really, really challenging book and covers huge ground. Uh, geographically from Nysna in South Africa to Iris, of course, in West Cork. Historically, it goes way, way back, thousands of thousands of years, uh, uh, looking at, you know, collapse of tree co cover in 1350 and another phase of destruction under Cromwell and pre-famine Ireland. I find that stuff really interesting and very challenging. And then there's the extensive range of characters in it, species, uh, neighbours, friends, Dexter cattle, you know, you name it. So it's an incredible book. Uh, I've really enjoyed engaging with it a few times now. And it's a really great pleasure to chat with you this evening, Owen. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but my my own grandfather was from Iris and his family, a couple of generations down there, uh, not too far from where you're, you are, I think. Um, so I know that it's a really beautiful part of the country and I just want to start welcome you properly and maybe ask you if you wouldn't mind if you tell us a little bit about that place, uh, what it was that attracted you to it and maybe what you've learnt in your living there, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, thanks very much Eil, for your very generous introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be on speaking uh, this evening. So what, what drew me to, to bear? Uh, I mean, I suppose like it depends how long you want me to, to make the story um, because it is quite a long story, but I, I'll try and keep it short so we can kind of like cover a, a bit more ground. I had been living in Dublin, um, and then I, I I built a house there, rebuilt an 18th century stone cottage, um, moved to Italy for seven years to learn how to carve sculpture in stone and marble, um, and then came back. But even before I went to Italy, I, I knew that I'd be coming back to Ireland and I knew that I wouldn't want to stay in Dublin. Um, so I guess throughout those years in Italy, I was thinking, where would I want to go? What part of Ireland? And it's, you know, reflecting on it, it soon became clear to me that I, I would want to be somewhere wild and and also somewhere where land prices weren't exorbitant because um you know my my funds were going to be limited and i did want to buy a, a substantial piece of land um and so you know somewhere close to to the 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 cities somewhere that's kind of easily accessible is just going to be more expensive so you know after a period of of looking around the country and trying to get a feel of which places represented um, exactly what I, I was looking for. I soon settled on Beira because it's just such a special place. It really is. And it's far enough away from everywhere, certainly from Dublin, and but also from Cork, mm. um, that 
you know, it, it wasn't at the time, it wasn't crazy dear. That might have changed since. I'm, I'm not really a fan with what's the situation now. But also, I just, the first time I ever came to Vera, I literally just fell deeply in love with the landscape. Um, and I think what it was, there was a few different things. Um, I mean, I was, it was while I was still living in Italy, I was back for the summer. Um, and I was studying sculpture over there. So, and working with sculpture. So that, I suppose that's the way my, 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 brain was wired at the time and what I found in Barrow was just that the lang the landscape was extremely sculptural with with um incredibly stra striking uh, rock formations um and the sea and just just the rawness of it all but there was another superimposed over all that. There was something else that was, in a sense, even more important that struck me uh, the first time I came, which was I had a thing about trees. So a big part of the the, the reason why I I didn't want to stay in Dublin, I, I wanted to have a live somewhere else where I had a different mm. or more. Um, more intense relationship with the natural world and trees were figured strongly in 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 that kind of the way i envisage the future so at the time you know when i started looking for a place the idea that i had in my head was buying a large a decent bit of land and then planting a whole bunch of native trees on it and, and kind of like spending the rest of my wa life watching those trees turn into a forest. Mm. But when I came to Barra, I realized that I could do so much better than that if I was really lucky, um, which is that various pieces of land that I saw for sale down here, uh, any, any of them that had been left unfarmed for a period, had literally started to revert spontaneously back to wild native forest through the trees seeding themselves. Um, and I realized that it it with with a bit of luck, it may even be possible to find a place that ha already had ready-made wild native forest there. Um, but I had <clears throat> I had no idea. I, I wasn't really prepared for the actual place that I ended up buying, which was like that, but just on absolute steroids. It just, it, it was so, it, the place was just so amazing. It was nearly too much. And I, st I still kind of feel that way. You know, I, I don't think I'll ever stop feeling that. But I remember the first time I ever came and walked the land it nearly overwhelmed me, the, the, the sheer beauty of what I was seeing. I, I spent a couple of hours walking around the land with a big lump in my throat and my heart beating uh, as if it was going to burst out of my chest. Um, and as I say, it was nearly too much. And I was, I was afraid. I, I, I made a conscious decision that day that, that I would never come back unless I actually managed somehow to, to buy the place um, and that I'd maintain a kind of a, a distant relationship with it as if it didn't really exist um, unless somehow it came through. And it did. Uh, and that's been my life for the last 15 years ever since. Mm. And it's been so wonderful. Mm. Um, it's like it's obviously like it's so powerful, even hearing you talking about being overwhelmed by it and the beauty of the of the place. But but you had this. It it also seems from what you've said as well. And I know you've written about it, that you had this idea of kind of creating a forest, but then realizing that that. It, it maybe it wasn't about you creating a forest, but letting a forest kind of rejuvenate itself and that this is quite a different it, well I would see this as something of a different approach to how many people approach 
kind of land use and forestry and biodiversity rejuvenation. And I just do you think that that is a fair description or would you could you talk a little bit more about that, uh, that whole approach that you adopted? Because it wasn't that you did nothing, because uh, I know you you did do something, uh, but it wasn't what you'd planned. Yeah, so I mean, there, there was there was a lot for me to do. Um, so the place was was trashed ecologically when I arrived because there were feral goats in the area and sika deer as well, both of which are invasive non-native species. And they were they had moved in probably about 10, 15 years before we moved down. And what they were doing was they were preventing the, the the trees from regenerating. So by eating every last seedling and also stripping out all of the incredibly rich ground floor that you should have in a place like this. Um, and all of this was also creating, paving the way for invasive non-native plant species to start taking over. And that was exactly what was happening. There was about seven or eight or nine of them were were seriously taking hold uh, and the worst of the whole lot was rhododendron which is a real scourge of native woodlands all all so certainly all up the west coast but in other parts of ireland as well so i used to work rectifying those those uh problems and and i did so by I applied for uh, a scheme called the Native Woodland Scheme to, to put up a fence to fence out the goats and the Sika. That took about a year and a half to, to work its way through the bureaucratic process. Um, and in the meantime, I set to work in my spare time getting rid of the rhododendron and the other invasive species. Um, then the, 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 the application for the, the funding for the fence was approved. And some contractors came in and spent a couple of weeks putting that fence up. And the result of all of this was absolutely spectacular. Like it was, again, it was just absolutely mind blowing in the sense that the whole place just started to explode with life. So you had um, drifts of, of wildflowers that I had presumed were just completely absent. Uh, bluebell, wood anemone, primrose, dog violet, uh sonical um and and scores of others um but on top of that you started to get tree seedlings uh sprouting everywhere both within the forest and on the the open parts of the land because it's not that the whole not all of the land was forested so you started to get tree forest spontaneously forming in in areas of open ground where previously there were just barren grasses and nothing really there biologically dead started to to transition into this far richer state um and it was just so magical to to witness all that and to to be a part of it um, and I guess that takes me back to to your your actual question uh, about natural regeneration. Um, and I think it's really important to for, for people people love planting trees, you know they and I, it's it's very understandable why people like planting trees. It feels good, you're you're doing something positive. You're you're interacting with the earth, with the with the soil, with a with a living thing, and it feels like a very kind of concrete step that we can take to to you know to, to doing something positive for for nature and for the planet. And I really wouldn't want to to take away from that entirely, but what I would say is that nature does it so much better because nature has been doing it for hundreds of millions of years you know i mean people only started planting trees probably within the last 100 or 200 years and nature was doing it for for hundreds of millions of years previously no problem the only thing the only reason why 
that has become difficult. Nature struggles to do that now in many places is because we have engineered things in such such a way that levels of grazing, either by domestic livestock in the form of sheep or cattle or goats or whatever, or artificially abundant numbers of, of wild grazers like deer or goats. Uh, the effect that they have is pretty much the same. They, they prevent the forest from re regenerating or they, in, they prevent the forest from spreading into open areas, just as was happening in my place with the, the goats and the deer. And that prevents the trees from regenerating. But, you know, if you reverse the those um, barriers that we have created, if you take away those obstacles to uh, trees will plant themselves. And they'll do a far, far better job than we could. Um, what do I mean by that? Why? Why is it a better job? Well, for a start, the trees are different. So, you know, when generally speaking, when trees seed themselves, they're wild trees. Whereas if you go to a nursery and buy native trees, they're not going to be wild. They'll, they'll be a kind of a domesticated version of the same species. And you might say, well, what's the difference? Sure, Surely a, a sessile oak or a downy birch is the same thing wherever it comes from, whether it's wild or not. Well, actually, no, they're two very, very different things. So it's kind of like the difference between um, a wolf and a poodle, in a sense. Um, in that poodles are domesticated version of wolves, versions of wolves after hundreds or of years, maybe longer of domestication uh, to, to tease out what we have decided we want in that species. Um, so they may technically be the same species, but they're two very different things. Um, but also, so that, that's one level to it. Another level is the fact that trees, when they seed naturally, they seed into places where you'd never plant a tree. So, you know, you can get a, an acorn plant lot cached by a jay in, in a kind of a, in, in a crack in a cliff, as there are so many of these kind of places yeah. on the farm here in Barra. And the, the tree then grows out of that uh, crack. And maybe because there's already a tree growing above or some other, for some other reason, it has to grow horizontally for 10 or 20 or 30 years before it can reach up to the light. And what you end up with is a tree that's completely unique uh, and unlike any other tree in the whole forest. And part of that is genetic, but it's also partly just to do with, it's a, it's a completely different mechanism. Um, and the upshot of all of this is that if you walk into a forest of planted trees, even all native trees, a mixture of native trees, they're all gonna be quite regular. They're all gonna be, um, you know, a nice strip, nice and in inverted commas, straight trunk and an even crown, and they're all gonna be quite uniform. Whereas walk into the forest here and it's just every single tree is different, you know. Uh, so aesthetically already you're, you're dealing with two very different things. But also, you know, it's, it's far richer ecologically because it creates a, a, a much greater diversity of niches for all of the, the forest inhabitants. Um, so, you know, you, you would not... The forest that I found here when I arrived, you could not create it by planting trees. You would never get anything even remotely like it. Um, but you know, just to just to very very quickly finish with a with a further element. I mean, there are, there are I could keep talking about this one aspect for the rest of our our session, and I won't. But I will just say one last thing on this, which is that. From a philosophical point of view, it's absolutely crucial now that we understand that 
our role has to change from being one of masters of this planet where we dictate and control everything all around us to, to, to stepping back to some degree and allowing nature to do what it does, you know? Uh, and that's, it's a really important thing to understand that um, and to, to, to take in the message that's there in that. Um, so, you know, just, I, I, I'm not opposed to planting. I think there are situations where natural regeneration won't work. Um, and, you know, in cities and so on, it's, you know, there's no problem getting a, a bunch of people to plant a couple of trees in their local lawn or whatever. Um, but where natural regeneration will work, it should be the default message or sorry, the default method. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting, um, the, that whole, that deeper philosophical kind of questions that it raises about how we see ourselves and um and i suppose our our kind of tendency these days to you know you you buy a tree you consume you with a kind of a monoculture kind of an, an understanding we don't even see that that has kind of framed our way of approaching the world that that we can create that that notion of us as creators rather than actually seeing ourselves as part of the the I suppose those who have who have and continue to participate in the exploitation or the use the use and the destruction of the natural environment one of the things there's so much in what you've said uh, it hits on some of what I'd like to ask you in a few minutes, but also there's loads I could I could ask you about actually in relation to everything that you've just said. And I, I've circled a thing around here that you, you said earlier on. I had a thing about trees, which in itself is like such a, a major, major thing to to talk about. And I love that idea that that you mentioned there as well about, you know, trees nearly like I suppose this is a very andro anthropocentric way of looking at it, but trees having personality and character and difference and, you know, that they're not all the same. But anyway, one of the ideas that that you wrote about and it really, really struck me is this shifting baseline syndrome. OK, and just for those who haven't read it, as I understand, it's still this idea that our memory is very short. We see ourselves within our immediate lifespan. And even within that, we cannot remember the abundance of biodiversity that was there when we were children. I grew up in the countryside and I, I do remember, you know, running through fields basically that were full of wild flowers, loads of, you know, the hedgerows and I'm very concerned about the destruction of the hedgerows. Um, you know, around the country and and that we forget what things were like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But what's really powerful in your book, I I feel, is that you, you, you talk about uh, us as part of an ancient, long history of destruction and exploitation of the natural environment and phases of that it's not like you don't give this simplistic linear history of destruction it's really complex and I just I suppose I just wanted to and it, it speaks to what you were talking about just there a second ago about changing our view of what our role is from masters to supporting rewilding protection and I just want wondered if you could comment a little bit more on that shifting baseline syndrome and how it affects what we do in farming and forestry and our engagement with the land, our relationships, that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, so shifting baseline syndrome is a, a hugely important um, advance in just understanding how we interact with our environment and how we're able to um to go from for example it, you know if you go back in in time in ireland back to mesolithic times um pre-farming the whole island would have been natural habitat of some sort or other virtually 
you know, the, somewhere up around 100% of Ireland would have been, and and about 80% of it would have been wild natural forests of some sort. And it would have been, you know, there were no, these weren't planted trees. They weren't all kind of uniform, as I described earlier. They, they were kind of like what what's in my place, but they would have been much older. A lot of them would have been, you know, some of the older trees would have could have been nearly a thousand years old or more, you know, depending on the species. Um, so very old growth, very, very rich in a way that I think is inconceivable to us now. And they would have it, it's not just a question of the trees and all of the living things there. You're talking about complete ecosystems. So you know, one of the reasons why um, overgrazing is such a massive problem for the natural regeneration of trees now is because we've wiped out all of the apex predators, wolves, bears, lynx, um, which would naturally um, regulate grazing, grazing animals. And they'd regulate them in various ways. Obviously, they'd, they'd kill some of them, um, predate on them, but also they change their behavior um, because when grazers know that they risk being predated, they, they their behavior shifts radically um, and they're much more skittish and they don't hang about in more dangerous areas. And also they're, they're, they, they breed less effectively because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of not, not relaxed. There's, there, there are so many different changes, so many changes on so many different levels. But the upshot is that, you know, all of these things balance an ecosystem. They make it, they, they, they make it what's called self-regulating, that it's, that it's all of the elements of the ecosystem together. Um, combined to make it a functional one and that's what we would have had in ireland across the whole island and we've gone from that to virtually zero so you know if you travel the length and breadth of ireland now looking for natural habitat you're going to find almost none and the bits that you will find are mostly completely wrecked, just as my place was when I arrived. Uh, so, for example, our, our most important piece of um, natural forest on the island remaining, we, we've gone from 80% natural forest down to around 1%, and most of them are, are, as I said, wrecked. So, you know, the most important of all of them is Killarney National Park, and it's in absolute ecological meltdown for the very same reasons that I found when I came here, which is overgrazing by sika deer and feral goats and invasion, particularly by rhododendron. And it's been that way for about for over half a century now, you know, and nothing has been done to change that. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you go from these pieces, these tiny little slivers of trashed habitat and in between, you've got endless expanses of just essentially farmland where where that are that's grazed by sheep or cattle or has Sitka spruce dead zone monoculture plantations, and that is you know apart from you know the odd bit of hedgerow or 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 other tiny little remnants here or there. That's essentially what Ireland is now. It's a big farm. And yet, most people think that's natural. Most people think that's somehow a natural state. So how, how can people go from a state of extreme uh, biological richness, uh, diversity and abundance to the diametric opposite, practically, and still think it's natural? And the explanation is shifting baseline syndrome. So how it works is essentially that human lifetimes are quite short, uh, relatively speaking, certainly relative to ecological time frames. We, we don't live that long. And in the past, we, we, did, we lived even less long, you know. So, and 
what uh, Daniel Pauly, who was the the, the guy, he was a, he's a marine biologist, and he's the one who came up with the theory in relation to marine ecosystems, but it was soon realized that it applied equally much so to, to land-based ecosystems, um, is that each generation of people uh, takes as as their kind of baseline the way things are when they're young so you described eilish when you were younger um running through fields and there were clouds of butterflies and other pollinators coming up off the the, the grass and the meadows and so on and i'm sure you can see that there's been a a, a drastic decline in in insect life since then the difficulty and 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 that so you are comparing things to that's your baseline and you can see the the changes within your lifetime what's more difficult to see is that it's an overall pattern that goes the the the, the, the little the, the that little bit that you see is just a small snapshot of a kind that's been going on for thousands of years and each new generation takes a new baseline that's poorer than the baseline of the people who went before. So as the baseline goes down and down and down, you know, it's 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 kind of, there isn't a general understanding of how far it's come. Um, and it's such an important, um, it, it, it's a real key to understanding how we, we can live in such a, an abysmally, nature poor country as Ireland and still think most people still think it's actually grand you know really really important and uh, that speaks to uh, another concept that you bring up in another one of the chapters the, the, the red pill concept from the matrix which is also really powerful the, the well as I un- interpreted it as I understand it it's kind of once you realize what's going on and that there's so much destruction, you cannot unknow that yeah. and be unaffected by it. And uh, so when that when I came when I came in, in reading your book, came across that, you know, that understanding of the shifting baseline syndrome, it really spoke to me because because it 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 is really important that we remember that the kids growing up today only see what they have today and they see that as natural, as you say, uh, but that is such a depletion and a destruction of what has been in the past. Anyway, uh, look, there's loads of questions coming in on the Q&A, so I'm actually going to divert over there if that's okay. And that's just fine. a reminder to anyone else, if you'd like to ask any questions, just send them into the Q&A. Um, and uh, some of these pick up on what you have been talking about. I'm going to read three of them for you first, if that's okay, and then go over to you. So the first question that came in was, what do you think about wolves being introduced to Ireland to reduce the deer populations like the invasive sick deer? Secondly, how long did it take for you to see the seedlings emerge on barren ground? Uh, The third one is a bit longer. It's Owen. Thanks a million for sharing your time and knowledge. My dad passed away a few years ago. We have an 80 acre farm where 90 percent of all the internal native hedgerows were taken out in the 1980s. My brother has some sheep which are about to be sold. He's on on board with doing what we can to encourage or allow wildlife and native trees back. I had wanted to put in native hedgerows again and oak saplings from acorns pinked from our local wood. Now I'm listening, not sure what's best. What do you think? And then he says, or he or she says, sorry for the long winded question. And then the last one that has come in, sure, I may as well give them all to you that have come in so far. I won't remember all these. All right, so I'll stop. So (laughs) So the first one is about the wolves, then about the seedlings, and then about best to take uh, acorns from the local wood or to put in native hedgerows again. I might. You might have to remind me of the last one. Uh, no after that's the first two. So wolves, um, ecologically speaking, there'd be no problem introducing wolves. Or, uh, and the, the effects would be entirely beneficial. There, there'd be there, Ecologically speaking, there'd be no difficulty. 
there would be no drawbacks. It would be all 100% positive. The difficulty with wolves, and just to say, that's been happening all across Europe naturally over the over decades. Um, Ireland and Britain are the only two countries now without wolves in Europe. Um, and the, the the reason why is because they can spread across uh, to, to to across Europe naturally, whereas obviously they can't because of the sea barrier here. So you have wolves in countries like Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg, which are far more built up, far more high densely populated, and they're generally doing fine. You know, I mean, you you, you do have some minor level of conflict here and there with farmers uh with having their livestock taken and so on but it's 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 generally very minor stuff um however having said all that i am not an advocate of re reintroducing wolves um into ireland at the moment and you know it's important to to emphasize the word reintroducing because they were here up until relatively recently um, the last wolf was shot in County Carlow. The last Irish wolf was shot in County Carlow in 1786, if I'm not mistaken, which isn't that long ago. It might seem like a long time, but it's really not. You know, it's it's um it's it's only it's only very recently in ecological terms. But I think that wolves also carry quite a lot of baggage. Uh, they're a difficult one for a lot of people uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, they're pack animals. Um, so they, they hunt in groups. Um, and I think, you know, people are raised up with all of this kind of like, you know, Hansel and Gretel stuff and all of these other fairy tales about the big bad wolf and also it's kind of like sharks the way sharks are portrayed by the media you get something similar with wolves they're these kind of horrible demonic uh animals which they're really not you know um they're 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 really just wild kind of collie dogs really you know um <laughs> They stay they're they're not dangerous to people. They 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 steer well clear of people. I remember reading that they found that in parts of North America inhabited by wolves, you had you were more likely to be killed by being struck by lightning or from a bee sting than to be even injured by a wolf. So I mean the, the danger to people is is absolutely minimal and similar to livestock uh the danger to livestock is very very low wolves tend to stay away from people they they're they're nerves of people so they they prefer to hunt wild uh animals rather than sheep or whatever but i think that you know in these kind of questions you can't just focus purely on the ecology uh as i said like Ecologically, wolves could be reintroduced tomorrow, but because of all of this um, baggage that they have for people in people's minds, I think I think it I I don't think it would be the right thing to do. Certainly not at the present time. Um, but I think there is another species which we should be concentrating on which doesn't present any of those problems, and that is the lynx. Um, so lynx are solitary animals, um, which immediately rules out that, that you know, that issue of a, a pack of animals hunting together. Um, they're, they're quite small, so they're about the size of a little bit bigger than a Labrador dog. They're beautiful looking cats. Um, they've got these kind of pointed tufted ears and these incredibly, you know, uh, the, the, these amazing uh, faces and, and poise and all the rest. But despite their small size, they're, they're capable of taking down a, a, a Sika stag. So they would help with the deer problem that we have here in Ireland. Um, 
But you wouldn't, they, 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 there's no example of Lynx ever having killed anybody or even attacked anybody. I think maybe there was one or two cases in Europe once, but they found that the lynx was was in, infected with rabies. So it wasn't really, it wasn't, and, and, you know, you could say the same thing about dogs, that dogs attack people when they have rabies. So it wasn't the lynx that was responsible, it was the, it was the disease that it had. Um, and even that was like one or two cases. So zero risk to people, virtually zero risk to livestock because again lynx are our forest dwellers so unless we're putting sheep um into forests which we really shouldn't be there there's virtually zero risk to livestock um so i would be i would be focusing on the lynx right now um that's that's the first question the second one how long did it take before um, seedlings started to appear, it happened immediately. So virtually, the, the, I remember the fence went up in November and the following, the following spring and summer, I started to find seedlings coming up all over the place, little oaks and hazels and all the rest of it. But having said that, um, another important thing to say about natural regeneration and again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier of we have these very human ideas for, around the speed at which things should happen. So we like instant results. We like results that, you know, we can kind of say, right, we expect this to happen here. And that's what that's exactly what ends up happening. But with natural regeneration, it's really not like that. So. You can have some areas of land that naturally regenerate back to they they the 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 the, the technical term is natural succession to woodland, and some area in some places that can happen very very quickly, to the to the to the extent that you will have where where previously you just had grasses you can be in closed canopy woodland within six or seven years, it can be that quick. But there's a kind of a, a scale of speeds at which it happens. And at the other end of the scale, after six or seven years, you just have uh, you just have seedlings six or seven inches tall and everything in between. But the important thing is there is that it's happening nature's speed. And there's nobody kind of saying, right, I think an oak would look good there and uh, a couple of hazels there uh, and maybe a rowan here. Nature is deciding. Nature is deciding I'll put an oak here or a couple of rounds there or I'll put nothing there. I'll, that That's, you know, that that's going to change into something else, you know. Um, now, the, the last question um, about the 80 acre farm, um, I've been getting, I've been inundated with questions of this type since I wrote the book. I've been getting letters and emails and people ringing me up and even calling to the door, asking me similar kind of questions, saying I've got a couple of acres up in Roscommon, belong to my uncle and he's passed away and I don't know what to do with it. Um, half of it is planted with Sitka spruce and, you know, what should I do? And it's really, really difficult for me to answer these questions because... You know, first of all, you can only really give, give good advice if you know the place. Uh, and that means going there and not just going there for a half an hour or an hour. You need to get to know a place really well to be able to know what to do. And then, you know, every everywhere is different and everybody's different. Not everybody's going to want to do what I did. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd say if people can you know, if you want to do something for nature, rewilding it is the best thing you can possibly do. But that's not not everybody's going to be able to do that. Um, rewilding, unfortunately, doesn't bring in any income, generally speaking. So for for most people, it means, you know, deciding that you're going to forego income from from that piece of land until hopefully things change in the future and that's one of the 
the main things that I I'm always going on about is if if I were was asked what is the one big change that you would make in terms of how things are how how we support people to 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 help with collapsing nature I would say what needs to happen is people need to have the option of being paid to rewild their land, including farmers. So at the moment, for example, if you're a, a small farmer in a place like Beira, your only options for making la a, a, a few bob out of rough, the kind of rough, rocky, pretty infertile land they have in places like this is sheep or sitka or if the land is a little bit better then maybe cattle um and we need to give people another option we need to say to them look you know because people people are paid subsidies for for doing these things they're they're paid subsidies for sheep for cattle for sitka uh for any kind of farming that they do or forestry but if you decide you're going to rewild a la some land and let it go back to nature, you'll be paid nothing. Um, now I got I got some subsidies or some funds when from the native woodland scheme when when I that, that also paid for the fence to 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 exclude the goats and the sika. I also got some income from that, but that was just for seven years, and then the income stream stopped. Whereas income from farm subsidies is perpetual. So no farmer is going to, you know, take income for seven years and then nothing for years, for decades afterwards over, you know, perpetual income. So that needs, that really needs to change. We really need to um, give farmers and other landowners that option of, of being paid to, to let their, their land go back to wild nature. Otherwise, I honestly think we're 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 it's the only way we're going to turn around the collapse of nature in this country. Thanks very much, Owen. Uh, two other questions came in there that speak to what you've just said, but I'll I'll read them for you just in case you want to say any more or if it prompts something slightly different. Uh, the one is the ecological and cultural landscape in Ireland is one of the hum one of human interaction over centuries, and there are very few landscapes untouched by humans. Is there not a responsibility from both a cultural and ecological perspective to continue to manage, albeit lighter touch, and to the benefit of the natural world itself? So rather than rewilding more, working on restoring natural processes, reframing farming as both production and protection. That's one. And the other is very, is very short. Amazing what you've done. Uh, what can the government do to cause the massive shift to rewilding that we need? And you may feel you've answered those, but just, just to see if you have anything else you'd like to say. Well, the first question is a really interesting one, um, and I don't entirely disagree with the, the person who asked it. I think that, you know, nature, what's called nature friendly farming is an important part of where we need to be going in the future. Um, so to, to be finding a better balance between production, food production or whatever else production uh, and nature so you know farming has been on this kind of road where if if you sit down for a moment and think about what farming is it's it's essentially taking a piece of of land that was ultimately without exception wilderness at one time that was a, a natural full-on natural ecosystem and converting that into a state in which the priority is producing food for, instead of thou uh, being habitat for thousands of species, the priority becomes producing food or something else for one species only, and that's us. Um, now, because of technical technological limitations in the past, um, that that objective 
was always compromised by what we could or couldn't do in the past. You know, back in the 16th or 17th century, we didn't have diesel driven machinery or chemicals or Italian ryegrass or whatever else, you know. Um, so farming had a massive input impact uh, at the start of the Neolithic when it was introduced, but it was nothing like the, 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 the impact that farming has today. Farming has been on this kind of journey of ever greater productivity, uh, maximizing product productivity, but nature has paid the, paid the price for that because, you know, increasing productivity inevitably means pushing nature further and further out. So, you know, if you walk into a field now that's just Italian, it's reseeded with Italian ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, and it's got sheep or cattle there, there's nothing there. You know, it's, it's biologically dead. You've got two species, neither of which are native, neither of which are, are kind of, you know, offer anything to, to in ecological terms and on, on very, very little else. Um, so a big part of the solution is is taking farming back in a kind of doing a U turn and and taking it back towards uh, a direction in which there is more space for nature. But um, that the that won't be enough in itself because rewilding which is just leaving land entirely for natural processes uh and and wild species offers so much more to so many more species there there are, there are always going to be a lot of species which won't be able to survive in that farm landscape no matter how nature friendly the the, the type of farming that hap that happens there you're in a, and all sorts of natural processes will be excluded as well you know um so like you know a good analogy is if you imagine a piece of amazon rainforests and over time people come in and they they remove the rainforest and they turn it into a cattle ranch uh, but in the beginning of that process, some of the species that were able to that, that existed in the in the the rainforest that was there before are able to hang on because the the type of cattle ranching isn't it's not that kind of ruthlessly imposed. It's it's fairly relaxed. So you've got bits of scrub and kind of wildflower meadows here and there and that kind of thing. But over time, as as you know. Um, the means allow the, the 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 type of cattle farming gets more and more um it limits things down to 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 just one species of grass and 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 the cattle and that's it mm -hmm. so if if you were to to say right how you know nature is dying here how do we ch change that around i mean obviously there's going to be two solutions there are going to be two approaches and you're going to use both one of which is to is to try to make the the kind of the 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 farming that you're doing less intensive, less less this that 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 there is a place for nature, but it would be absurd to pretend that that's the only solution. And allowing some places to go back to full on rainforest isn't an even more important part of the solution. Mm. Um. So you know the 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 usual question that gets kind of asked at this point is well you know if if farming is becoming less productive and on top of that you're setting aside large areas of land <laughs> just for for wilderness for wild nature you know what are we going to eat and that's that's a that's a very valid question and the the answer is that you know to make all this happen and what you're talking about here is turning around ecological collapse, essentially, in Ireland and globally. Because everything we're talking about here applies both locally, nationally and globally. Um, we're going to have to start, if, if we're going to turn this around and make all this work, we're going to have to start 
um, moving towards plant-based diets. It's as simple as that because a plant-based diet requires only ten, around 10% of the amount of land um, that, a, that an animal based animal foods based diet does. Um, and that that essentially frees up 90% of the land for, for nature. Um, but we also need to start, you know, um, we need to start looking at other aspects of it. We need to start. It's not just a question of there, there can be a problem with extensive farming. So a lot of people think that intensive farming is the issue and intensive farming is responsible for, for huge damage to nature, but so is extensive farming. So an example would be that the, the, the mountains around here or in Wicklow, depending on where people are, um, you know, those are grazed by sheep and are produ produce virtually no food for the amount of area involved. So that's that's an extensive type of farming. And yet the impact is is massive because you're 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 dispensing with vast areas of land that, that would be forest like what's in my place here which is by the way it's it's what's what i have here and the type of forest that would cover most of ireland is actually rainforest it's temperate rainforest and it's hugely rich but you're saying right we're going to we're going to do without all of that for roughly around one sheep an acre you know that's so that is not viable in terms of cost benefit uh, and, a, and a cost benefit analysis you you have to say well look that that just has to go you know but when i say that i'm not advocating that people be forced to change what i am advocating is that we make it financially viable for people to 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 choose to do other things that are actually better for for nature for the planet for the climate and for people and that means and this comes back to to the second question, what's the and and I kind of already answered this, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it again because it's so important. The most important thing that we could do is give people in places like the Bear Peninsula nothing forced. I'm always at pains to say nothing should be mandatory here. People, if you force things on people, it'll backfire. Now, all what what we need to do here is just give people another option and then let people decide themselves. And if you say to people, look, you can carry on with your sheep uh, if you want to, and you'll, be con you, you'll, be con you'll continue to be paid to do that. Or there's this other option. You can, you can receive the same funds for rewilding. Um, and if you give people those choices, there'll be plenty of people who'll say, well, sheep are part of my you know, family tradition, I've, I've farmed sheep all my life, or, you know, it's important, or I, I want to do it for this or that other reason. But you'll also get people who say, well, do you know what, I wouldn't actually mind trying that rewilding option, because I'm flat out with my, my little business, or it'll give me more time to spend with my family, or whatever else. And or maybe people because, you know, there are farmers who, who love nature, too. And yet, you know, it's beaten out of them uh, the, 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 the possibilities of expressing that uh, because, you know, people can't afford to give up their livelihood. And if your only possible livelihood is sheep or or Sitka spruce, then that's what most people are going to do. And we need to give them another option. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Owen. Um, listen, we need to we need to actually start to wrap up. Um, I, I feel that there's so much more we could ask you about and and definitely listen to. Uh, somebody just there had to leave early. Wonderful lecture. Thanks to you, Owen. And somebody else has highlighted, I was going to mention it myself, the new uh, fourth biodiversity action plan, which has just been published, as you'd be uh, aware, and some mention of some funding for environmental 
environmental schemes in it. And of course, uh, I know I've read already read some critique of it. I'm sure you've lots to say about that as well. Um, and I'm really glad that you made that, you know, in that in your last comment as well, you you made that global link. And as I guess that's a that's a, a major consideration and concern for for those who are hooked in with with Kolov is you know what does this mean at a global level and how can we work in solidarity around these issues supporting farmers and landowners to you know to to uh, to um uh, I suppose support, supporting policy which supports farmers and landowners to rewild more, to rejuvenate the biodiversity and to, to turn it back, as you've been talking about. I'm, I'm, um, I mean, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to say, Eilish, that the, the, um, the National Biodiversity Action Plan, it's not going to change things. I mean, it's the it's not all bad there's there's a couple of minor good things in there but it's not what's required right now we need we need a sea change and it's just not happening it's not coming from the government you know it's it's um uh and i i think the only way things are really going to change is if people become literate on the issues and and start putting pressure you know, start 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 demanding change because otherwise, what we're going to see is indefinite. Um, you know, people. You know, stuff like this. It's it's always framed as well. It's a step in the right direction, mm. and we've been having steps in the right direction forever. And it's time to go beyond steps in the right direction to just sorting this stuff out. Mm. You know, because uh, it's really not difficult. I mean, as I said, you know, my place started to change very, very quickly after I took some very simple steps. But I've watched Killarney National Park, which isn't far from here, continue to go down go downhill uh, throughout that time. And all you hear from from you know the the various officials and and government people involved as well you know you can't do stuff these things take time you know we have to carry out another report we can't rush this and the, the place has been dying for over half a century we need to we just we need to get the lead out and get serious thanks so much on um we'll leave it there on those encouraging words um yeah, I really appreciate it. It's lovely to talk to you. Um, it was, um, you know, as I as I mentioned, an incredible read. Uh, but it is uh, revisiting what you have written, the richness and the depth of it and the challenges that are in it is, is also really worthwhile. So thanks very much to you. Thanks to everyone for participating and for your really interesting questions. They were fantastic. Thanks, Owen. Thanks very much, Eilish.